Hi, I'm Greg Murphy, and this is Nathan Wallace, a neuroscience educator. Mm -hmm. And in this episode, we're talking about the impacts of stress on driving. Great to see you, Nathan. Kia ora, Greg. We are moving at a million miles an hour, everything these days, just a million miles an hour, dealing with so many things uh, in, in such short spaces of time, <laughs> and, and um, which creates stress, right? It's, it's, yep. it's, a, it's something that we're all having to deal with, everyone's dealing with differently. and, and you know, for a for a truck driver, you know, mm. having to, to to do this job and 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 yeah. deal with the pressures of it all, and then be living a life at the same time, and bringing yeah. to work all these um, mm. you know things that are going on, and then having to have that responsibility. That you know, yeah. stress is enormous. It has such a effect on on things. How does it work with the brain? Yeah, it's fascinating stress, isn't it? Because we, we divide it into tolerable stress and toxic stress. Because some tolerable stress actually can just serve to motivate you to, um, a little bit of stress can actually engage that frontal cortex, that brain number four. Because you're like, oh, I need to be more alert now. So that, you know, so that we would call tolerable stress. That's, you know, stress that can help us. Toxic stress is more that stuff where we're not so much aware that we're taking on four times as much, that the pace of the world has moved at such a, you know, rapid pace. Um, that we're becoming stressed and not realizing how stressed we are. And so our decision making and our judgment, our good judgment and stuff is falling down because of the scales. Um, so yeah, we have to, we're set up for toxic stress now, you know, a lack of sleep and, and um, managing the kids and managing work and yeah, it, it, and that's without COVID. You know, then you have an environment like COVID. Unpredictability is one of the biggest stresses you can get, being in an unpredictable environment. So COVID's made everyone's life pretty unpredictable. So. Yeah, I think drivers along with everybody else are in danger of getting into that toxic stress type where you're running on running on empty. And so let's just put that in context with the you know the brain yep, and yep. how that works. Really, a stress you can sort of perceive is that like it's a competition between brain one and brain four. So your survival brain, your brainstem, you know, down the base, actually put them on a set of scales. Just think brain one is on one side of the scales. And brain four is on the other side of the scale. So brain four is that frontal cortex, the one that's going to, you know, keep us in control and knows what we're doing and keep us safe. They work like they're on a set of scales. So really, the more stressed you are, the more access you've got to all of that higher intelligence and that ability to keep things in control. So when you're not stressed, brain, basically brain number one's in charge. So if it's stressed and it's highlighted and activated, then brain number four starts to go offline just because of the scales. It's just a biological principle. That's why things like mindfulness are so big, you know, topics that people talk about today, because that's essentially, mindfulness is calming that brain stem down, um, that survival brain, so you can get access to your full cortex. So you can think of consequences, you can have empathy for other people, you can um, have all of your higher intelligence there ready to pick up on, on novel things happening on the road. Um, so yeah, stress in any context is really, that's what's happening biologically in the brain. For driving, that just means that the more stressed you are, regardless of what that stress is, whether it's a fight with your wife, whether yeah. it's, um, in lots of ways the brain just perceives stress as stress. You know, this brainstem is aroused, and when that brainstem is aroused, then you're going to lose access to that part of the brain, brain number four, that's going to keep you safe on the road and, and yeah, and it's, be quick responding. So it's, so it's massively difficult to manage in many cases for people. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, and you can't just sort of have a system that says you're supposed to do that. You know, you can give all the shoulds yeah. and supposed to as you like to the yeah. frontal cortex. It doesn't come online until you calm down that brain number one. So stress is a major, I would guess that stress is a major cause of, you know, a lot of accidents and a lot of consequences because brain number four is the one that's going to keep you safe. And it's if you're stressed, properly. you're just not, it's not working properly. I mean, some of that's basic stuff like, you know, hydration. Yeah. If you're dehydrated, then your brain starts to shut down and the brain starts to get a bit more stressed. So it can be as simple as drinking water. Um, you know, and that, but that goes for sleep as well. Or water, you know, the basics of diet, sleep, hydration. So fatigue. Yeah, fatigue, yep. Yep. But I mean, even stress, like I say, you know, they're arguing with your wife. Yep. I mean, that stress causes a brainstem arousal. That's your, you know. And that's just, but that, and that's just normal everyday yeah. activities, yep. things that happen in everyone in, so, yeah. in, in life, right? So people often use ritual to get around that. Right. So, you know, just the actual ritual of getting up and into the truck and parking your sunglasses up there. And there's a little body ritual that your body remembers. And that might be a routine to help you click out of that and click into work mode. But if you don't consciously do that, then actually, you know, sitting in the truck for a long period of time could actually be what your brain thinks is the ideal time to be going over and over and over that fight with your wife to try and sort it out. So again, it always sort of comes back to your own rituals and routines that you use your brain number four 
to have a little ritual that lets go of that stuff and says, right, I'm moving into this professional space. I mean, you must have had to do this as a racing car driver. You're like, okay, right, I'm at work now, like you said. I'm, I'm focused on this. Ritual is, tends to be the key of doing that. You know, yeah. that your brain associates that, you know, I remember um, living in Christchurch, I had a car stacker, you know, car stackers, and they, mm-hmm. you park, park in it and it has to stack the cars. So the, the lights on my car, the sort of the mirrors on my car had to be folded in. So I knew that if I just leave it to me randomly remembering, I'll tuck the mirrors in, which I don't normally do, I would forget one in every 20 times. So that means 19 out of 20 times I was successful and I remembered. But one out of 20 times, I'm going to be parking, you know, 50 times a month. So that means several times a month, I'm going to leave my mirrors out to get scratched by the car scraper. So to anchor it, I did it in a body ritualised way. I knew that I um, did the keys and turned off the car and pulled up the windows and ritualised it, it did it exactly the same order each day. So I know after, you know, one month of getting into the car and making myself do it in that order, it almost becomes like body memory yep. to turn the wing mirrors in because it's automatic. Even if I'm stressed that day, and I, you know, that brain number two just remembers the sequence of get the keys, put the handbrake on. So I can use ritual in that way to help myself, but you've always got to engage that brain number four first, that frontal cortex, to get that pattern in place. I mean, there was days I arrived at the racetrack and you, you know, you didn't want to be there yeah. uh, for v- all various reasons mm-hmm. and all that kind of stuff. Yeah. Um, but I think ritual was definitely part of it, of, of moving, yeah. and then you know, basically you've got to go and put all your gear on. Yep. Right? So you've got to yep. go and put your fire-proof underwear, you've got to put your socks, mm-hmm. you've got to put your suit, you've got to put your boots, you've got yeah. to get all your, and you've got mm-hmm. your gear, you've got to yep. make sure you've got all your stuff, your helmet, yeah. all that kind of stuff. Mm-hmm. And then there's a process of getting in the car. So, and I think uh, that definitely became uh, automated and, you know, that you, because you were going through that process, yep. you ended up, and then you get in the car and then they put seat belts and, and all that. You know that was a that yeah. was a, 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 a that ritual to yeah, remove exactly. those other thoughts that were going yep. on in your head, and that was yeah that was just sort of automatic. Yeah, and that, and that is how he, that is. I really, I just really haven't thought about that before, really, yeah. to be honest, which is strange because yeah. I've done it so many times. But it but it was an automatic release, I suppose, of yep. of that stuff. So the brain does work like that, that that ritual and routine. You see this right across. Um, I encourage parents with their little kids. Um, sing them the same three songs just before they go to sleep. So when you take your kids to bed, do the bedtime stories and stuff. Sing them the same three songs in the same order, and you actually end up like hypnotising the child. So like, you know, my youngest daughter, the last song we sang every night was Twinkle Twinkle Little Star. Now I just have to sing Twinkle Twinkle Little Star to where she just about passes out and falls asleep <laughs> because she, no matter what time of the day it is, and she's an adult, but um, mm. she recognises the effect it has because her brain associates so much hearing that song and then falling asleep. So if your brain associates getting it, you know, taking the suit off, doing all that ritual you talked about, with then moving into this different state, that will do it automatically. Mm. But you kind of still need to consciously. I mean, sometimes they just work automatically for us, but usually you've got to engage you've that got conscious to work thinking that process to know, keep, yeah, 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 this is what this is what the ritual is doing. Mm. Mm. Auto- it is. I mean, it's like you. Uh, that's why I like dividing it up into the four brains because there is this automatic behaviour coming from brain number two, which is that automated work most of the time, but brain number four has got to be engaged to to change that what is not automatic programming. Yeah. It's not just all automatic driving, or we would have, you know, those carless drivers would be a whole lot simpler now if, we, if it was a predictable algorithm. It's not. You need, it's almost like the carless drivers, the, the driverless Driver's cars, car, yeah. Yeah, the, the driverless yeah. cars, one they one. can they can pr- reproduce brain number two if nothing novel happens. Yes. So we can, That's right. we can put you on this set track that we know nothing novel. But you need brain number four. We still need humans because you need that and brain number four. And that's, and that's where, you know, when yeah. something out of the ordinary do- happens, it that's doesn't where the handle it. Yeah. And that is really compromised if you're stressed, you know, so because, of, again, because of the scales. Wow. So That makes so know, much sense. And in class, and at a teaching setting, we might do a mindfulness exercise of just controlled breathing to calm your brain stem down. Um, but in the driver context, again, that using that ritual, some form of um, how do you let go of that stress? to come into this environment. Because you can do it. Humans change their frame really, really quickly. You know how you can be, um, you know, as a parent, you can be um, telling off the kids and get quite angry and grouchy, and then, you know, the postman comes to the door and you're like, oh, you know, how are you? And you're instantly all lovely and friendly. You were a nutting out mess, you know, a second ago. You can change your frame uh, quite quickly. Uh, so we have the ability. We just need to ritualise it and be conscious of it. We do need to manage stress. I mean, especially as modern day, it's very we've got good. more and more stresses yeah. all the time now. More reasons for it. Eh? The pace of the things go, you know. 
I mean, I think you just watch old television shows and you see how slow the pace was when you're watching. You know, that would not last today. We have four times as many scenes happening in a television show. So that half hour show has four times as much happening as a half hour show from the 1950s mm. because our pace has gone so much faster. So that can seem like a good thing and we're getting more done, but it's all arousing that brainstem. The faster your pace is, the faster your it, internal engine, where does it end? the more aroused your brainstem is, the less access you've got to your cortex. So you do need to you know, stop and centre yourself and get that brain number four online. People look at what uh, what I do at racing cars, you know, and, it, and it's, it's on television and, and it's a sport that yep. people love to watch and enjoy, mm -hmm. would like to do, that yep. kind of thing. For me, it was a job. It was, it was still yep. a job. For yeah. everyone, it's still a job. You, you, you have huge amount of stress and pressure to perform. Yep. You know, so that's, that's something you have to deal with every time you arrive at the racetrack, every time you, you get in a race car, yep. you're dealing with the uh, pressures. Mm -hmm. It doesn't matter who you are because yep. there's expectation, right? Yep. You can be the best guy. Yep. So you're seen as the best guy, you put on this pedestal, he's the best, right? Mm -hmm. So you've got to stay the best. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You've got to keep delivering that performance to mm -hmm. maintain that, that what people perceive you as. Yeah. Uh, you're, you know, you, 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 you're struggling. You're in a, you know, you're not able to perform the way that you're expected to perform. So the stress is there to try and up your game, get better, yep. improve. Yep. Mm -hmm. um, you know, you've, you've got, you know, uh, one of your kids is in hospital, at, um, you know, broken in the leg, and you've had, yep. and you're having to go to work. Yeah. You're having to go and drive your race car. Yep. You're dealing with those thoughts. It, it, everything's yep. the same as everybody else. It's just a very different looking kind of yeah. job that is exposed to the world yeah. um, in a different way. So, I mean, those are the, it's the same things that anyone else is dealing with if we're talking about, you know, truck drivers and transport operators, that kind of stuff, people driving for their jobs. Yeah. There's, this, all that stuff is, is really the same. The difference for me and for what we're doing is yeah. that we get in those, in those race cars where, you know, we're all going in the same direction. Mm -hmm. We're all going around the same bit of racetrack, you know. Right. Um, in, you know, for 10, 20, 30, 50, 60, 100 laps or whatever it is. Right. Right. Um, so, and it's perceived as high risk. I was going to say that we associate that with, you know, crashes and, and you're fireballs every single and, moment. Yeah. And yeah. But it's, it's, I've never, ever got in a race car and ever thought about um, what potentially could happen if I hit something or if I crash. I, okay. I feel immensely safe because of the preparation around who's done all the work, the team, the car, the build, the, the fire yep. suit, the helmet, the hands device, you know, all that oh, stuff. Yeah, I suppose we're not thinking of that immediately. When, with my, the perceived risk is just thinking, seeing that fireball. I'm not thinking about all the safety gears. Yeah, but, the... but then we, we go and get in a car or in a truck or whatever, and we go on, on our roads here in New Zealand, and, and we're like, well, this is normal. This is every day. This is, you know, oh, there's yeah. no risk. It's not going to happen to me. Mm. It's, it's far more dangerous out there on our on our yeah, roads yeah. any given day of the week any given minute of yep. the day yeah that it is and so you know it's it's what is being what we've been told what we've been shown yep you know um that what the brain that, perceives as stress yeah i mean it's got its own perception eh? so we perceive that getting in the racing car is going to be a whole because you're doing 250 than, kilometers an hour yeah, yeah yeah than driving to the i mean that comes up when you talk about people who are scared of flying and trying to get them to see that they actually pose more risk in the car drive to the airport than there ever was getting on the airplane. Mm. But of course, people are yeah normalise that level of stress. That's right. And yet we are you're disproportionately scared of flying in a plane. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Perceived stress is quite different from actual stress. But we all think we've got this ability to make this very rational assessment of risk. But you know that just highlights that actually our our risk assessment is a bit faulty. It's coming through our perceptions. Put me in a race car or in a racetrack any given day at any speed. Versus, um, you know, um, yep. driving on our on our roads. I know I know which one's more dangerous. Yeah, which yeah. one you're actually more likely to get injured on. Yeah, yeah, statistically. Hey, thanks, Nathan. Another really insightful discussion. Um, so, if you want to check out some more of these, just head to eyesupnz.co.nz. Mm -hmm.